All right, thanks, Will. Um, I am not formally on Nostr, but uh, it feels good to be trending on Nostr and having people pay you sats um, because you can pay lightning anywhere in the world. So uh, thank you, Will. Um, and I also want to start with uh, thanking uh, Gary Leland. So let's all give Gary Leland a hand. Um, e each year, this conference uh, never um, it, it just never fails to one up the prior year. Um, each year it has a lineup of speakers that I always want to learn something from or I've already learned something from. And it's actually the hardest conference to give a presentation for because by and large you are all rabid Bitcoiners. So when anybody gets up on this stage, it's, it's easy to explain some principle about Bitcoin to a bunch of people that don't understand it. Um, but when everybody is already starting with the baseline that Bitcoin is the best form of money, how do you come up here and give a presentation? So Gary does a great job of year after year, not only just getting people to show up in terms of the, the type of speakers, but it is the longest running Bitcoin conference. Uh, and, and he stood up for us when uh, everybody else was shutting down and, and I'll never forget that. And so um, I just want to thank him again. We don't need to give him another round of uh, applause, but uh, I did. Uh, Gary Leland's a leader and I really appreciate it. All right, so with that, I'm going to get into to my talk. So uh, I was, when I found out that I was going last, I was actually pissed off at Gary. I was like, okay, everyone's going to be exhausted um, and everyone's going to want to get to the bar. So I was thinking about making a funny talk when I already prepared a serious one. Um, but I just decided to change how I was going to start it to, to get your attention. But um, the name of my talk is uh, the beginning of the end game. Uh, Bitcoin is a price system. And I'm going to talk about a principle, but just as I, you know, am starting with the baseline that you guys already understand Bitcoin, uh, I'm going to talk about it from a perspective of helping you better communicate because it's the principle that I think is most important but least intuitive to help you better communicate to your friends and family why Bitcoin is important and why the world's converging on it. Uh, but then I'm going to have a call to action that's, that's more specifically for you. So the first half is going to be about uh, helping you help your, your friends and families and the normies out there. And then and the second half is going to be a call to action for you guys. So I'm going to start with uh, Secretariat. How many of you are familiar with Secretariat? How many of you have seen the film from Secretariat winning the Belmont Stakes in 1973. Okay, good. Not many of you. All right. With that, the idea here that I'm going to talk about is Bitcoin as the triple crown winner, as the um, store of value, the medium exchange, and the unit of account, and the end game is the unit of account. Um, Secretariat, for those of you who are not familiar, won the Triple Crown in 1973. Uh, winning the Triple Crown is hard because each of the races are different lengths and certain horses are built for speed, certain horses are built for stamina. It's very difficult to have all three things in the same horse or to be the best at it. Um, but it's not just that Secretariat won the, sil the Triple Crown, it was how he won the Triple Crown. Um, and so that, I'm going to play the, the full two minute video and then, and then we're going to talk about it. On the outside, Sham getting ahead in front as they move around the turn with Secretariat second. Then there's a large gap. Make it eight lengths back to Mike Gallon in third and Vice of Prince fourth. And Private Smiles is still a trailer. They're on the back stretch. It's almost a match race now. Secretariat's on the inside, by ahead. Sham is on the outside. They've opened 10 lengths on Mike Gallon, who is third by ahead, with Vice of Prince fourth. Then it's another eight lengths back to Private Smiles, who is trailing the field. They continue down the back stretch, and that's Secretariat now taking the lead. He's got it by about a length and a half. Still Sham, 10 lengths back, Mike Gallon, Vice of Prince. They're moving on the turn now. For the turn at Secretariat, it looks like he's opening. The lead is increasing. Make it three, three and a half. He's moving into the turn. Secretariat holding on to a large lead. Jam is second, and then it's a long way back to Mike Gallon and twice a print. They're on the turn. It's Secretariat is blazing along the first three quarters of a mile in 109 and four fifths. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like 
a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. Secretariat by 14 lengths on the turn. Sam is dropping back. It looks like they'll catch him today as Mike Allen and Vice the Prince are both coming up to him now. But Secretariat is all alone. He's out there almost a sixteenth of a mile away from the rest of the horses. Secretariat is in a position that is impossible to catch. He's into the stretch. Secretariat leads his field by 18 lengths. And now Price of Prince has taken second, and Mike Gallant has moved back to third. They're in the stretch. Secretariat has opened a 22-length lead. He is going to be the triple crown winner. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish. 25 lengths on the outside. Sham, get me out. All right, so the... The takeaway from this is that on the back stretch, when that was the third race, that was the third and final leg of the Triple Crown, and that that race was over before everyone in the stands knew it and before every other horse on the, on the track knew it. That Secretariat knew he was about to just hit the burners, and most races are won by maybe a nose, maybe a length, um, but what we're seeing in Bitcoin is that Bitcoin's already won. And that Bitcoin winning starts with its fixed supply, but it ends with Bitcoin as a price system. And while it might not be particularly obvious to everyone in the world, um, that Bitcoin isn't just going to win, it's going to destroy the competition. Um, and what, what, that, what that horse did, that, that second place horse, it, its will was broken. Um, and its will was broken with a quarter of the race left and then it fell back and, and ended up in, in fifth place. Um, but the big point being that um, Bitcoin, that horse had everything that it needed to do to do everything. And sometimes people will say, well, Bitcoin can do this, it can't do that. And the ultimate reality is if Bitcoin can enforce its fixed supply, it will be everything that, that money needs it to be. It will be a meat of exchange, it will be a unit of account. So we're gonna talk about that and then I'll get into the call to action. So. Um, Mike, if we can skip ahead, I don't want to start the, um, the race again. All right, so uh, the end game is beginning. Um, and so this is what I'm talking about, store value, medium exchange, and, and the unit of account. Um, so the principles that I talk about when I, when I go through with normies, I'm going to talk about this to you first and then, and then talk about it in a way to abstract so that you can relate it. It is that there is a best form of money. It's the form of money that can't be printed or that's hard, hardest to produce and that money converges to one. And that principle of money converges to one, the first half is easy, the second half is not. The idea that money converges to one is what I've personally found when I'm talking about Bitcoin to others that is hardest for others to take in because they see a world of, of fiat currencies. Um, but it's all very linear logic. It's that if Bitcoin has a fixed supply and it is credible, that it will store value. If, if Bitcoin does store value and that fixed supply is credible, it will be used to trade. And if Bitcoin does those first two things and is used to trade, then it will, that trade will ultimately be denominated in Bitcoin. Um, but there's this other idea that humans are rational. And when I talked to Bitblock Boom two years ago, I talked about hyperinflation. I said I wasn't going to make you feel doom and gloom about hyperinflation. But it's that hyperinflation is rational if the government, the Fed, the banks, however you want to think about it, if they create money out of thin air, people will stop trading their finitely scarce time for that. And Bitcoin is the other side of the coin of hyperinflation. Um, so this is for you guys. This is a way, if I have somebody deep down the rabbit hole, the way I explain this concept to them is that the, specifically the money converges to one concept. It's that um, I have to have the form of money that you're willing to accept. And I always talk about it in the idea of literally relating me to you. Like if I want to buy the goods that's, that somebody in front of me is selling, I have to have the form of money that they're willing to accept, but they have to accept the, the form of money that I have. So it becomes a, it, it requires a consensus. But then if you think about the next person over, um, that it applies to them too. If I give you money, then the person next on the hop also has to accept the form of money that the first person had. That same problem actually extends out to all 8 billion people in the world. That's the way that I help somebody understand it on a very individual level. Um, but there's this ultimate idea of the end game of Bitcoin being a price system and that 
when you start to think about this principle, and if there's one resource that I recommend for people, it's the use of knowledge in society by Frederick Hayek. It's that prices don't exist if a massive amount of people do not converge on one form of money. Or said another way, that a price system is the output of convergence on one form of money. And that might seem obvious, but it's not obvious to most people. And when you think, start to think about or realize just how fundamental price is, the price of a water bottle, the price of parking, the price, price of a hotel room, the price of an um, airline ticket to get here, that it's like, where did all those numbers come from? Um, but where they came from was the world converged on one form of money. And the output was this very idea of price. Um, now, if you tell these things, that I just told you, and you guys are Bitcoiners, so you probably understand it. This is what the world hears. Like you can go in and be like, Bitcoin is not crypto, um, Sybil attack, um, you know, double spend problem, Byzantine generals, fixed supply, like, you know, censorship resistant. And you can, you can try to relate in any possible way why Bitcoin is different. You know, why Bitcoin is not crypto, Bitcoin not blockchain. Everyone, just here is that you're a crypto bro, you know, and that's that's probably the most frustrating thing about uh, being a Bitcoiner. I've I've sat in presentations where I've given a two-hour presentation about explaining all those things, and then I get introduced as like, hey, this is Parker, my crypto guy. But it's this acceptance that these last slides are the fundamental reasons why that connect the dots between if Bitcoin has a fixed supply of 21 million to it will do all of these things. It will be the medium of exchange. It will be the the unit of account, but Realistically, someone is not going to relate at that level. So, how to communicate to normies? Um, it is first, and I'm going to go through five examples quickly. One, the world previously converged on one form of money. I tell people that the world previously converged on gold. They do not need to understand why gold is money uh, to understand why Bitcoin is money. They just have to accept that the world previously converged on one form of money, it was gold. They don't even need to be able to explain why, but they have to ask themselves the question, why and was it by coincidence? The next example is themselves. Virtually every individual in the world has only ever interacted with one form of money. Uh, and that's not to say that they haven't gone on a trip and you know bought things in euros or gone to Mexico and bought things in pesos. It's that on a daily basis, they only interact with one currency. They only buy and sell things in one currency. And the question is why and is it by coincidence? It wouldn't be that case if the world hadn't converged on one form of money. Uh, prices at the grocery store. Now, the um, great Silicon Valley VC firms like um, Andreessen Horowitz, the New York firms like uh, Union Square Ventures, Sequoia Capital, they will have you believe that you will walk into a grocery store and rather than see all prices denominated in one currency, that there's all these prices and there's going to be a hundred cryptocurrencies and each one's going to be priced in some different denomination. Um, but the reality is when someone goes to a grocery store, all the prices are in one currency. So the question is why and is it by coincidence? Um, the Home Depot is not a grand conspiracy. Um, at a single store, there's thousands of goods and the Home Depot only takes one form of money. Um, so it's either a conspiracy uh, by hallucination or it's the output of rational thought. Um, the last one, thinking about each individual good in the economy. This is uh, Texas's ERCOT power market as Pierre Rochard, if he's here, likes to talk about that we have a crisis every day because we've got wind and solar. But the, the more fundamental point is that this is one good and that every good is a market and they're all traded in one currency. Um, that th this one price is coordinating power for 38 million people in the state of Texas. Right now, the price of energy is spiking to about $3,000 um, per megawatt hour. But the point is everybody that's buying power in Texas is only transacting in one currency. And so the, the ultimate question rhetorical that I always ask people is why and is it by coincidence? And so when I go through all of these, it's simply helping people understand that concept that money converges to one because anything else that you tell them about Bitcoin is going to have no anchor point in reality, the fixed supply, anything if they don't start with that principle that they know something about money because the hardest thing to understand about Bitcoin really does start with the the question what is money so the the core fundamental idea of this is it's the price system um, and this is where I'm going to transition my talk into more of a call to action um, and it is 
that the, the price system is emergent and it is emerging right now. And what I mean by that is that every decision of yours to, to save or spend, you're pricing Bitcoin. Um, every fiat to Bitcoin conversion, you're pricing Bitcoin. Every dollar sale that's dollar denominated and actually settled in Bitcoin, you're pricing Bitcoin. And every sale denominated in Bitcoin that's exchanged in Bitcoin is pricing Bitcoin. That when you start to think about this idea of the world converging on one form of money and that the end game is a price system that can affect day-to-day -day transactions, it's kind of hard to get, well, how do we go from where we're at today to, to the future? Um, so when I think about that in specific terms, it's thinking about, I have a salary of $5,000, I convert 1,000 to Bitcoin, 20% of my time equals approximately 3.8 million sats. Um, if I buy a good, I'm doing the math as to how many sats, even if I'm not quantifying it in sats, I'm thinking about the trade-off, do I buy it or sell it, or do I not buy it? Um, but then at the end, also, if I decide not to buy something, I'm ultimately starting to price things in my head in sats, and that it's not going to be a flash cutover where all of a sudden we go to the grocery store and everything's priced in Bitcoin. That, it, that it's actively a process of emerging. Now, this is the key point. It's that Bitcoin's price system, and this is where I'm you know, speaking to each one of you as individuals, um, that Bitcoin's price system is singular, not circular. Um, I'll get to the next slide that is uh, circular economies are very tiresome, um, but Bitcoin adoption is a personal journey and it's a personal journey at every stage. Um, and there is no circular economy. Everything is highly specialized and the, the only thing that you control is your destiny. Uh, so focus on yourself and that means you and your customers or you and your vendors or, or, or anybody who you pay or people who pay you. Um, you can't fa manufacture your own circular economy. All you can do is control your own time and your own actions. So this is the point. A lot of Bitcoiners, I don't want to say LARP because that's unfair, but a lot of people talk about how we need a circular economy for Bitcoin to be uh, successful. Point is, you don't get paid by the same people who pay you. That is the nature of a, that's literally what money enables us to do. Um, we're not bartering. And that, that as a consumer, it's not going to be consumers who cause this trend of making people pay in Bitcoin. It's going to be you as a merchant, you as a professional, demanding that somebody else pay you in Bitcoin. That uh, what Mark Moss said earlier, where he said, you know, who's gonna build the roads? And if not you, then who? Um, that this is where it starts. It starts with, with Bitcoiners, not normies, saying pay me in Bitcoin. Um, and this is, this is maybe the probably side you can take away the most from. It's that when Bitcoiners think about the circular economy, about Bitcoin, you know, you know, being able to facilitate all trade and that economies are circular, it's really an imaginary theory. Um, the right side of the page, I think it's the right side, um, that is really all you are in control of. Um, who pays you and who you pay. But realistically in that equation, what you can control most of who you're delivering value to is who is paying you because you are you are the one who is voluntarily opting in to do work for somebody. Um, and this is another key, just be selfish. Normies versus Bitcoiners. The normies of the world, they need to understand Bitcoin, but somebody first needs to understand why Bitcoin is gonna store value before they can accept Bitcoin payments. And oftentimes people want to go into the, the, the little grocer or the, the coffee shop and teach that person what Bitcoin is and get them connected to receive Bitcoin. But the point is that if you pulled 100 of your Bitcoin or friends, one out of 100 is being paid in Bitcoin right now. Um, you probably you might run a company and you might not pay your employer or your employees in Bitcoin. Um, that don't expect of somebody who does not yet understand why Bitcoin stores value to suddenly turn around and go from zero to one and start accepting Bitcoin. Uh, and so, so when I think about people saying pay me in Bitcoin, it's really got to start with Bitcoiners. It's not, it's not normies. Um, and this idea of being individualistic and being selfish, you know, don't try to save the world, just try to save yourself. Uh, Bitcoiners owning businesses are the ones that are going to usher in uh, Bitcoin is a price system. Uh, and, and so rather than focus on things that you can't control, literally start taking action because that first action uh, is actually very hard. And while some people think, and, and I have a, an example of this, while some people think that people won't pay you in Bitcoin, while it's 
it's irrational for me to pay somebody in Bitcoin that I don't think is going to keep it. But if you have an expectation that somebody wants the Bitcoin, they will pay you in Bitcoin. Jimmy's been running his, his book sales out there, you know, for the last two days and 85% of his sales have been in Bitcoin, but he's given everybody the opportunity to pay in card. Uh, and so it's, it's generally one out of complacency, but, but when you start to, to actually consciously think about being paid in Bitcoin, it's easy to shut down. But the hardest step, rather than thinking about how you're going to get the butcher down the store, down the street to get paid in Bitcoin, start thinking about yourself because that's the, the, the thing that you can actually control. Um, and this is a good example. Like one of the, the things that got me thinking about this, this is a podcast that has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but I recommend it. The dude's got a phenomenal Georgia accent. So if nothing else, uh, Will Harris, he runs um, White Oak Pastures in, in Georgia. The Beef Initiative did an event there. Uh, but this is basically Will Harris saying these things. He said, what I do is highly replicatable. It's not highly scalable. He said, I'm a deliriously happy person. I'm a happy son of a bitch. I see a lot of frustrated, unhappy people in this space. The difference between me and them is they are trying to save the world and they might not be able to do that. I'm trying to save white oak pastures and I'm probably going to be able to do that. I don't go to bed at night agonizing over saving the world. I go to bed at night thinking of the 180 people who come to my farm every day. And he's talking about his employees. So it's really just kind of thinking about this idea of singular versus circularity. And these two things are not the same that um, if you buy dollars or get earned dollars and then and then they're sitting in your bank and it needs to go through a payment processor to get to another bank to get into the merchant's account to then get over to a bitcoin exchange to then get into bitcoin even if you're going to use a bitcoin company going from bitcoin to bitcoin is fundamentally different uh, a few things that are different is that you're training your customers that you accept Bitcoin. Second thing, you're communicating your values. Jimmy's out there communicating his values by taking Bitcoin and all of you, at least 85% of you, and I'm not gonna call out the 15% that didn't, decided to pay him in Bitcoin. But it's more a lesson that you're communicating your values when you're saying pay me in Bitcoin. And if you're someone that has customers that are Bitcoiners, they will pay you in Bitcoin if you enable it because, because and you can go, you know, I talked to somebody about it where like they show up and they wanna pay dollars, but then they feel like, you know, well, shit, like if I, why does, you know, if Jimmy wants to be paid in, in Bitcoin, why, why wouldn't I do that? And if, and if he didn't then take his wallet out and pay in Bitcoin, then uh, he would have been thinking about that and, uh, and judging himself the, the whole time. It's also the cheaper way to get Bitcoin on your balance sheet um, at the end of the day. So it's training your customers, it's communicating values, and, and it's a balance sheet decision and it's training. Um, but this is the real important thing. Um, Jack Dorsey put a tweet out about two years ago saying hyperinflation is going to change everything and it's happening. I think Bitcoiners um, know that it's happening um, and, and you guys won't be able to read on this slide, but the, the point is that in 2013, GM wrote down its pace, uh, bull, Venezuelan boulevards from four to one to six to one. And within two years from then, it had written 99% of its boulevards off. And if you Google when did hyperinflation start in Venezuela, it happens after GM um, wrote off all of its boulevards to zero. Um, and so the point is that when you think about that first devaluation from four to one to six to one, um, that's what the dollars depreciate against real goods and services in the last three years. Um, and it's to take action before you absolutely have to. So at Bitblock Boom 2020, I said if you wait to learn about your money hyperinflating on TV, you've waited too long. Bitblock Boom 2023, if you wait until hyperinflation to get set up and start receiving Bitcoin payments, you've waited too long. Um, and that receiving Bitcoin payments is ultimately a balance sheet decision. It's about protecting and insulating your business uh, and getting set up and doing it before the crisis actually onsets. Um, and this idea I talked about at Pleb Lab, it's, when did Noah build the ark? Um, and the rhetorical answer is before the rain. Um, and so if you wait to say, pay me in Bitcoin until you have to, um, this is ultimately about common sense and survival instincts and self-preservation. It's not to prove that it's possible. 
um, and I'm eating my own dog food. So for those of you who guys might like, um, I got set up to, to receive Bitcoin on my crowdfund. The, the URL is gradualthensuddenly.xyz. Um, you can capture the URL to go to the crowdfund, uh, but I highly encourage people to start taking it seriously because hyperinflation is not the end of the world, but it is happening, and it's upon all of us to, 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 to be responsible and to, to be high agency and to take action. And one of those critical steps is to, um, to start telling people to, to pay me in Bitcoin. So um, that's my talk, and uh, it's got two and one, and I'm done. So I'll answer a couple questions, and, uh, and then go from there. We have a mic in the middle of the room for questions. If anyone has one, come on up to the mic. Any questions? Yeah. What would you what would you say to them when they say I, I can't handle the volatility? Not, so hold on, I'm I'm not saying I, I'm asking my question is not to convince them to accept the volatility. My question is how to tell them to mitigate it. So I think that the question is, hey, if I'm talking to a local farmer or rancher, how do I kind of help them understand, you know, that they maybe should be accepting Bitcoin payments despite the volatility or help them get comfortable with the volatility. So I'm actually not gonna answer that question, but I'm gonna answer it in, in the sense that I think as, as Bitcoiners generally, we should be focused on, it's like those type of people first need the Bitcoin standard. That I wouldn't show up to somebody's door and be like, you gotta accept Bitcoin so I can pay you in Bitcoin. That it would be like, okay, if you're interested in Bitcoin rancher, I will help you understand why it's not too volatile in that full gamut. And then somewhere later down the road, you're going to come and say, well, now I figured out why Bitcoin is going to store its value. Now I want to get set up for payments. And so in that, you know, triple crown of getting to that end point, it's, it, it's actually backwards to start, in my opinion, to start someone off as payments, because if they don't understand why it's going to store value, why would they ever convert it directly for it? Uh, and also our time is scarce that uh, trying to people, help people understand this, it's like help those people understand Bitcoin, everybody in this room start getting paid in Bitcoin as an order of operation. Hey, Parker. So um, <clears throat> there's, I think I'm fairly certain that um, a while back, Eric Voorhees and other people like him have kind of made the claim that, okay, with technology, um, it's trivial to convert any kind of currency into kind of your own mental model currency. And, you know, fundamentally, I feel like that's flawed uh, because I think it's supporting your point, but I'm just wondering if you've had any, you know, ways of kind of addressing that sort of thought process. So is the question, it's fairly trivial to convert something into another currency's value? Yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, he's obviously involved in a bunch of other cryptocurrency projects, and I think it's him just kind of justifying, trying to uh, say, well, yeah, actually you can have multiple currencies. Um, yeah, people yeah. try to justify unethical things all the time, so I get it. Um, that I think the answer to that question is that, um, for there to be a price of the other currency um, or to have a conversion ratio between two currencies that there first has to be a price system for the euro or the yen. And so there's a dollar price system, there's a euro price system, there's a yen price system. So yes, it's fairly trivial to convert dollars to euros, but that was predicated already on mass convergence on one form of money. And that in reality, the euro's price system and the yen's price system both emerged off the same thing that the dollar price system emerged off of, which was gold. And so it's that he's basically um, like a look over there where it's like, well, no, but how did price in the first place exist? Because what I explain is that mass convergence on one form of money is a prerequisite for any concept of price to exist. Um, and so they all emerge from gold being, you know, euros or really before the euro existed 
other uh, country currencies having price systems that emerged off of gold. So it's kind of like you have to explain the fundamental of why any price exists and can that happen on a first principle basis unless a massive amount of people all decide to use one common form of money. And then the question is, well, why would they use another? Got it. Yeah, that's helped. Thanks. So you got a good job, uh, good job offer. You're going to take the job. They can't pay you in Bitcoin. So the second best is to simply take the cash and buy Bitcoin. Agree. <laughs> but, you know, and, and like when I, when I say this, I think it's like everybody needs to think about these things, right? It's not, I don't have an expectation that a hundred out of a hundred are going to be able to do it, but you could go find another job if, if you got a good one, you know, if you already got a good one, then your time is scarce and valuable uh, and you can go to your employer and ask them right doesn't hurt to ask um, and and so the point is there, there's there's enough people who can and they just have to to not be complacent and do it because if it's one out of a hundred a day which it's probably less than that if it were five out of a hundred or ten out of a hundred that's a lot better than than we're doing today but realistically it's not focusing on the 10 it's just each person thinking about themselves and saying hey am i in a position to do it because you're right if you're not you get those filthy dollars and you convert them to bitcoin yeah, yeah you go talk to your pension and you orange pill them they're on uh you know they're on the side of the screen uh, they're the normies on this screen so you get them all the bitcoin standard and then you get them to turn your pension assets into Bitcoin. That works. All right, Zach. Uh, hi, Parker. Uh, since there can be tax challenges with being paid in Bitcoin, would it not be better to be paid in dollars and then sweep the profits to Bitcoin? Again, like I go back to, you know, when did Noah build the ark? If you wait to uh, start getting your rails set up to accept Bitcoin payments until the world's burning around you, uh, you've waited too long. Um, and so I also think that what people often overlook is um, there's friction both ways. There's a lot of friction in the dollar system. Um, so if you're, you know, again, everybody's different, but if you think about merchants selling their services, they've got holds, uh, they've got chargebacks, um, they've got accounting and tax that they've got to deal with. And then at the end of the day, they're converting to Bitcoin. So, uh, and then anytime they want to spend it, um, again, then, then there are those consequences. But people, as, as Jimmy's showing out here in practice, that if you decide you want to hold Bitcoin, that, you know, if you do the calculation, it might be 4% cheaper to take Bitcoin directly than to, um, than to get it into dollars, pay the processing fees, and then go through the conversion fees. So you're gonna, you owe taxes either way, right? Um, and so you're not paying taxes on each individual transaction. You're doing a tax return just as many times. Uh, you just need to make sure that you're accounting for Bitcoin's volatility, so. Uh, so this is kind of a quick one. So at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a tool, right? And my big question, what do you think is the biggest limiting factor for merchants using that tool to accept payments? What is the biggest limiting factor? I think that it is that the tools are still emerging, right? And that um, I think it's the case, it was the, it's certainly the case with what uh, we built at Unchain is you have to put collaborative custody out there for people to adopt collaborative custody. Um, you gotta put tools out there and people have to start adopting those tools um, before additional capital can come in to, to perfect those tools. So there'd be a lot of things to, to make the process that Zach just described um, of the the kind of friction that's introduced by taxes a lot more flexible. But the, the chicken and egg problem is I've got to put the tool out there that people will use. And then as people start demanding Bitcoin payments despite the friction, more capital is attracted to the space and then the tools are perfected. So the automations to accounting systems and to tax reporting systems where they go from kind of elementary or basic to you never have to think about it and it's done in the background. But, but it starts with a market of people saying, all right, I figure out that the, the boat's leaking at every point of the ship. Uh, I need to start communicating to my customers that they can pay me in Bitcoin and I'll figure out 
the the tax consequences because i need it's not just about getting the bitcoin today it's about being set up and and training behavior and conditioning customers and communicating values before you have to one what parker i think your message is very important because not only how you do it not only that you are accepting the bitcoin but that you're putting the message out there in the meme space in people's minds bitcoin accepted here and when you see that everywhere it moves the overton window to the discussion of hey bitcoin is being accepted it, and, and even if you don't ever get a bitcoin in an entire year it doesn't matter that, that people have seen it will help make the shift yeah, I mean, I think that's right, but I would just really focus it back on the individual, right? Where it's like, yeah, it's going to be better the more signs out there that say pay me in Bitcoin, but it's really, you know, my message is just be selfish. This is not about, you know, saving the city, saving the state, saving the planet. It's about saving me, my family, like my company, the people that work for that. Um, and so if you start to think about it as like, you know, put my oxygen mask on before helping the, the small children next to me. It's like, if you start being selfish and realize this isn't about like the, the greater mission, it's about, I got a problem and I need to create a solution for it. Then what you just described will happen if enough people do that. That will be the output of enough people saying, all right, I'm gonna go through the, the, um, the things that I need to do, the steps I need to take to, to take this very necessary step. So I agree with you. It's just kind of like looking into yourself and being like, all right, I'm gonna get up off the couch today and go to the gym. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get set up. Okay, fantastic. I'll, I will be selfish first. Okay, last question. Hey, Parker. Um, what do you think about incentivizing uh, your clients by giving a discount on your Bitcoin sales? Like, do you do that? And if yes, the percentage you're, you're giving and just your general thoughts on it. Um, this is not my sock puppet, Simon. This is just Simon and a friend. But that's a great question. <laughs> you know, give me a softball. Um, it's very important and I think about it differently. It's that uh, it's like a slight reframing, but it's very important. It's like you don't give a discount if somebody pays in Bitcoin to incentivize. It's that if you want to pay me in fiat, there's a surcharge because there's actually, there's actually more friction to me to take the dollars and go through the dollar system and then get them into Bitcoin. So yes, I do think that, and it's part of something, it's not something we have yet in ZapRite, but it will be there that what we're planning to do is charge $25 for our service. Um, and the price is $25, but if you pay in Bitcoin, it will be $30 if you pay in fiat. So it's like, we will take the fiat, we will go through the friction to get it into Bitcoin. But uh, what we want, what we would prefer for our, our value communication is, please pay us in Bitcoin, but we're happy to take your dollars if you pay us 20% more. Thank you. All right, with that, thank you. Let's, uh, let's give Gary another round of applause. Um, he's a champ, so thank you guys. Grandpa, why do you have so much Bitcoin? Well, it all started in the year 2023 when I attended a conference called BitBlock Boom. What's BitBlock Boom, Grandpa? It was a conference where people talked about Bitcoin. This was way back when we used something called the US dollar for money. What? Bitcoin wasn't always the world's money? If it weren't for great speakers at BitBlockBoom like Jimmy Song, Adam Curry, and Preston Pish, we'd all be living in pods and eating bugs. Instead, I was able to avoid fiat enslavement and secure generational wealth. F***ing legend. Be the legend your grandchildren deserve. Experience the best Bitcoin conference out there and join the Bitcoin revolution. BitBlockBoom, the only conference for true Bitcoin maximalists. Book your tickets today at BitBlockBoom.com and use the code BBB1 for a special discount.